One of the funniest ways for a megalomaniac country to screw itself over is to invade a cursed region that should really be left alone. A good example is Vietnam, the homeland of guerrilla warfare. Another example is the Caucasus Mountains where only the insane kings go to wage war. Of course, how can we forget about the country that recently humiliated the living hell out of America, the most powerful country of all time? Let's set sail to Afghanistan, the notorious place known as the Graveyard of Empires. <laughs> the Pamir Plateau is considered the roof of the world. Imagine all these giant, gorgeous mountains sprawling out from the Pamir Plateau. These mountains in particular are called the Hindu Kush, which literally means Hindu killer in Persian. Ah, the euphoria of getting demonetized from the very first video. The Hindu Kush saw all sorts of early civilization. This region, birthplace to one of the oldest existing religions in human history, Zoroastrianism, was ruled by the Persians from the ancient days. Buddhism also thrived here when it was introduced a few centuries later. After Alexander the Great's conquest of Persia, a Greco Indian kingdom was born from the chaos and was a perfect environment for Gandhara art, a hybrid of Greek culture and Buddhism. With the introduction of Islam, Buddhism was effectively eliminated from the region. A lot of ethnic Turks soon flooded the place, but the uncompromising Persian descendants just refused to be evicted. No matter how wildly the winds of cultural change howled around them, they retook their homeworld, generation after generation, century after century. In the 11th century, these territorial people were named Afghans, and the land that they lived on, Afghanistan. Yup, this region is now permanently cursed for empires. The 13th century is here, and with it comes the mighty Mongol invasions. The Khwarezmid Empire was one of the early victims of this serial killer of civilizations. The last Shah of Khwarezm, Jalal al-Din, decided to make his last stand against the relentless Mongols, here in Afghanistan. Surprisingly, he was able to completely teabag the fearsome Mongols here by abusing the impenetrable steep mountain terrain in the Battle of Parwan. The Khwarezmid Empire was inevitably brought down to its knees, but even the Mongols had to rage quit and leave South Afghanistan unconquered after such an unpleasantly traumatic experience. Throughout the years, many foreign powers have tried to rule Afghanistan, from the Timurid Empire to the Mughal Empire to the Safavid Empire. Understandably, the Afghans didn't take kindly to foreign powers. During the Safavid Empire, the Afghans started such a successful rebellion that they even conquered their captors after humiliatingly overthrowing them. After years of back and forth chaotic warfare, the Afghan based Durrani Empire finally took control of the region. This is when we can start seeing glimpses of modern day Afghanistan. The Pashtuns, the majority race in the Afghanistan we know, are direct descendants of the Afghans. Meanwhile, in the north, Russia was an emerging superpower desperately wanting to join the enticing party of imperialism like the other cool Western countries. It was doing everything in its power to find an ice-free port. If Russia wanted to sail on the open seas, it was forced to either pass through the Ottoman Empire to reach the Mediterranean Sea, pass through Siberia to reach the Far East, or conquer Middle Asia to reach the Indian Ocean. But there was this one small country with a somewhat strong navy that was willing to embark on a global harassment campaign just to prevent Russia from expanding any further. The British Empire. It persuaded the Ottoman Empire to blockade the Russians in the Mediterranean and the Japanese to blockade the Russians in the Far East. Now, all it had to do was block off the Indian Ocean. Unlike other regions where Great Britain was more than happy to persuade other countries to do the dirty work for it, it wanted to take matters into its own hands and prevent Russia from going anywhere near its golden goose, India. The Russian forces have already conquered the north of Middle Asia. There was no more time. Britain decided to attack Afghanistan, establish a pro-British government, and meet the Russians head on. The Barakzai dynasty recently overthrew the Durrani Empire to establish the Emirate of Afghanistan. Britain used the whole I return this country to you, the people, as justification to start a war. Although Britain was able to take Kabul and Kandahar while toppling the Barakzai dynasty with relative ease, remember this, even if it's the one thing you take away from this video. The actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. In the snowy winter of 1841, a massive rebellion snowballed in the steep, harsh mountains. 
The Pashtun warriors were excellent snipers in this terrain. These warriors would fire outrageous pot shots from ridiculous cover with these insultingly outdated matchlock rifles that have been rendered obsolete in Europe. Just to give you an idea of how unimaginable this was given the technological differences, imagine a malnutrition Gandhi bludgeoning the ever-living shit out of Mike Tyson with his pea stick. The 700 British soldiers and 3,800 Indian mercenaries were massacred in the Hindu Kush during a maddening retreat against an invisible, laughing enemy. The British attempted to desperately negotiate for peace, asking only for safe escape in return for surrender. The Afghans promised, Sure, we understand. Of course you can leave. But proceeded to merrily hunt the retreating British regardless. An additional 4,500 soldiers and 12,000 civilians were buried in the Hindu Kush. What remained of the terrified British fled Afghanistan, but returned in 1878 with 40,000 soldiers. The death of Shah Sher Ali, who went to request aid from Russia, left the Afghans confused with no leader. This time around, the war ended with a British victory. The British experienced the terrifying Pashtun warriors firsthand and arbitrarily split the country up into two with the Duran line to cause an internal divide within the Pashtuns. This way, they'll be too busy fighting each other and the British could adopt Afghanistan as a protectorate. The British, rather understandably so, no longer had any interest or confidence whatsoever in the direct governance of Afghanistan. They just wanted to leave the lethal natives right there as a buffer against Russia. Good luck getting past them. Jesus Christ! Poor Russia was blockaded from the Mediterranean due to the Crimean War, humiliated in the Far East from a costly war against the Japanese, and exhausted from pointless wars against British proxy nations. Russia finally agreed to formally acknowledge British rule over Afghanistan, and instead chose to split up Persia with the Anglo-Russian Convention. Peace didn't last long. Immediately after the British Iron Fist started to slip following the First World War, there was another rebellion in Afghanistan. This is the third war between Afghanistan and Britain. Britain already in tatters after World War I. Had no choice but to liberate Afghanistan in the following year of 1919. Good riddance. Finally independent at last, the Afghanistan Kingdom had a straight 40 years of unprecedented peace, progress, and reform under Shah Mohammad Zahir. As soon as the age of imperialism drew to a close, the stage was set for the Cold War. Unfortunately for Afghanistan, the Soviet Union was looming over them to the north. The Turks of the north were already fully indoctrinated with communism, happily absorbed as a member of the Soviet Union. In 1965, the intoxicating whiff of communism was spreading from the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan. In 1973, a pro-Soviet royal, Daoud Khan, dethroned the king in a coup. Five years later, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan executed Daoud after another violent coup. Afghanistan became a full communist state. Crazy timing, really. The exact same year, the neighboring country of Iran was plunged into chaos with the Islamic Revolution. Afghanistan has to take some inspiration from that, right? The infamous anti-communist Islamist guerrilla group Mujahideen started a civil war immediately upon birth with a bang! Now, the Soviet Union wasn't very happy with all this Islamism nonsense spreading next to its pure communist comrades. They tried to support the Afghanistan military by deploying military advisement groups, but this was a pathetic fart in the unstoppable tornado of Islamism. So, the Soviet Union decided to start a frontal invasion of Afghanistan. Their KGB assassinated the president as soon as the war started, put a new puppet government in power. Seems like a pretty efficient way to end the war, right? Remember, Actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. A puny change in government doesn't stop the Mujahideen. The Afghanistan home ground advantage was just so outrageous. The feared Soviet tank battalions that served them so well during World War II were rendered completely useless by the steep mountain, forcing them to abandon all their expensive equipment and march on foot instead. Well, without the cover of their armored vehicles, the Mujahideen, again, pulled out their insultingly outdated matchlock rifles and went on a merry killing spree against the 20th century superpower, just like their ancestors did to the British a hundred years ago. As the culminating point was reached and the Soviets were forced into the slow bleed of a stalemate, 
They didn't even know where or even who the enemy was. America gleefully makes the problem several magnitudes worse following the age-old wisdom. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Remember how Britain split the Pashtuns in two with the Duran line? Half the Pashtuns are still technically living in Pakistan, but they don't really care about borders here. So, America just drops massive amounts of weapons into Pakistan to kindly raise the difficulty for the Soviets to absolutely fucking brutal. After nine full years of flushing unimaginable amounts of money and human lives down the toilet of Hindu Kush, the Soviets completely withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989 without anything to show for it. Two years later, the Soviet Union collapsed. I have to assume that they would have lasted at least a few more years if they didn't screw themselves over so terribly in Afghanistan. This, my friends, is the background for where the Taliban starts. There was an abundance of war orphans to choose from due to the frequent civil and international wars. The Taliban would take them in, radicalize them, and train them to be their cult soldiers. These guys took over Kabul in 1996 and then overthrew the Afghanistan government. They declared an Islamic Republic and executed the president in public to prove a point. Ruling with unforgiving Sharia law, all female schools in the country were merrily laughed out of existence within 24 hours of the Taliban taking power. Oppression of minority groups and other religions were an everyday occurrence. They went full fundamentalist and started banning whatever they wanted with full impunity. In 2001, they even kindly gifted a massive fuck you to their fellow Muslims by blowing up this 1,500-year-old Bamian Stone Buddha through an act of ultimate trolling, leading to a rather understandable loss of support from other Muslim countries. In September of 2001, you know, this is the year that the incident happens in America. You know this story all too well already. America was furiously out for blood and justice for the blatant attack on their soil, doing everything possible to find the person responsible, Osama bin Laden. Conveniently, the Taliban was sheltering him. America asked calmly, Hey, can you hand him over, please? Or else. For context, even North Korea was pissing its pants and screaming to anybody who would listen. Yo, this isn't me, man. Uh, I, I know I've done some messed up things in the past, but it really isn't me this time. Please, man, you gotta believe me. The Taliban, for some reason, tells America to kindly fuck off. In October of 2001, an outraged, bloodthirsty America invaded Afghanistan. No matter how harsh the terrain of Afghanistan may be, if the strongest military really wants you dead, you're dead. Within a month, the Taliban was annihilated. But, and there's always a but, you know what's coming next. Say it with me. The actual war in Afghanistan starts only after it's been conquered. The American weapons so cheerfully donated for the purpose of fighting the Soviets were now aiming straight back at the American soldiers. Unlike America's initial expectations, the newly established democratic government wasn't doing very well and bin Laden slipped through the cracks. Furthermore, America also declared war on Iraq in 2003, which only added more chaos to the maddening cacophony of confusion. The new government to replace the Taliban was too corrupt and incompetent to win the hearts of the Afghan people. To make matters, unimaginably worse, another radical terrorist group of an equal headache size as the Taliban called ISIS entered the stage in the 2010s. All this combined left Afghanistan a complete and utter clusterfuck with no clear solution whatsoever. After about 20 years of war, the traumatized America decided to finally call it quits and negotiate with the Taliban for a phased withdrawal. In essence, the whole thing ended up like the Vietnamese War, where needless blood and money was burned for no clear gain. In 2021, the Taliban smoothly made their long-awaited comeback as if nothing ever happened. Which megalomaniac country will next fall victim to Afghanistan, the cursed region that always gets the last laugh against the most powerful empires of its time? Some are guessing that it's now China's turn. That line that the British drew to split up the Pashtuns is a modern border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. See this uh, narrow stretch of Afghanistan territory extending east? Yeah, that's called the Wakhan Corridor, and that's China touching borders with Afghanistan right there. 
Afghanistan under Taliban rule, robbing borders with the oppressed Islamic population of West China. We can only imagine what's gonna happen next. Good luck, old friend. We'll end this video with a prayer for peace and coexistence in Afghanistan, but we might be a few centuries too late for that to happen. This has been David Bradford from Knowledge Raiders, and thank you for watching.